Um, coming up next, we have Ethan Marcotte. Ethan did this thing several years ago where he kind of invented responsive web design, so there's not a whole lot else to say. But I will actually add that I really enjoy watching Ethan present. Um, great stories, and I look forward to what he has for us today. Thanks. Wow. Uh, Liza, thanks for setting the expectations low. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I think Jason, Liza, the entire team at Cloud4, let's give them a quick round of applause. This has been an amazing, incredible day. I've been an amateur fan of architecture for quite a while, and it's always seemed to me like a field that's in a constant state of interesting transition. And this was especially true back in the 1950s and 60s when architects for the very first time were actually embracing computers, as rudimentary as they were, to help them with some of the challenges, the design challenges of the day. In the middle of all this, in 1966, an English architect named Cedric Price stood up and addressed his peers in a lecture. It was really kind of influential at the time. And in it, he posed this kind of foundational question, which was, technology is the answer, but what was the question? Now, that's some powerful shade being thrown at most of his peers, right? I mean, but, but you know, there's the, the reason I love this is because it's a question about priorities, about first principles. Are we embracing technology as a field because it's the next shiny innovation? Or is it being put to service to some greater purpose, some larger design goal? Now, Cedric Price was, thanks to this lecture and other contributions to the field, kind of credited for introducing this notion of user-centered design to architecture for the very first time. But I wonder, as responsive design has just turned five this year, if we should be asking a similar question. That if responsive design is the answer, what was the question we were trying to ask? Now in the early days, that was probably fairly easy, right? I mean, mobile was really kind of the, our big inflection point. We'd been, we had such a narrow view of the web for so long, designing basically desktop-centric, fixed-width websites. And when this new dominant browsing context kind of just appeared out of left field and took us by surprise, designing more flexibly and embracing the fluidity of the web as a completely flexible design medium was one way of working our way out of that problem. But it's been a really interesting time for responsive design, now more than ever, I think, because we're dealing with new interaction models and browsing contexts, you know, on almost a, a, a monthly basis, if you think about it. And I love this video that Brad showed first off, where basically this device, this smartwatch, that has a really wonderful little WebKit-based browser on it, was actually loading a responsive design that was designed a few years before it was even invented. And we're also dealing with, you know, I think it's to be fair, some, some context fatigue, right? I mean, don't dig and drive, kids. We have browsers in frickin' cars now, <laughs> as terrifying as that might be. But we're keenly aware now that the web is everywhere and anywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's, we don't have any control over when or how people are actually inter interacting with our work. And we're keenly aware of device fragmentation and diversity in general. And so as a result, it's been really amazing to see the conversation shift subtly from a design standpoint, where we've sort of ousted this idea of the page as our sort of guiding design principle. And we've, you know, as we've heard from many speakers throughout the day, that we've embraced this, this idea of designing more modular patterns, these smaller bits of our design that we can then stitch together to create something larger and more responsive. So in other words, we're no longer designing from the canvas in, as Mark Bolton called it, that we're starting from an abstract system of uh, columns and rows and then filling that grid with a whole bunch of information and stuff. Instead, I think we realize as responsive designers and developers that our work begins a level below that. You know, Trent Walton had this really wonderful blog entry that he wrote a few years ago, talking about his transition from kind of a responsive design skeptic into somebody who's doing some beautiful responsive design work in general. And he talked about how he traded the control he had in Photoshop for a new kind of control, not less control, but a new kind, one in which he could use flexible grids, flexible images, and media queries to build not a page, but a network of content that can be rearranged at any screen size to best convey a message. And that's a beautiful image, really, because as we've moved away from this idea of our designs as being you know, this sort of one holistic, tightly bound entity, we're starting a level below that. We're investing ourselves in building those networks of content by uh, you know, investigating the needs of the modules that comprise a larger responsive design. 
Each one of these modules or patterns, I mean, they're effectively small, responsive layout systems. They often have their own breakpoints independent of the other patterns around them. But then when we build these small layout systems, we can then stitch them together to build these larger, more responsive designs that can be viewed anywhere or any when. The thing is, is that the more responsive design work that I've been doing and adopting more of these pattern-driven principles, I've found that it's been changing the way that I think about designing for the web in general in a couple subtle, but I think kind of important ways. You know, here's a, here's a really simple example. This is not gonna blow anybody's socks off, but I've been working on the redesign of a blog, a fairly popular one recently. And as with any website, I mean, it's got a whole host of really interesting patterns kind of peppered throughout it. One really modest looking one is this article teaser that appears on the homepage or on section fronts. Um, hold your applause. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys have probably designed a few of these just even just today. Um, but it, it's got some fairly common, you know, individual components inside that make up this larger pattern that is displayed on many parts of the site. You know, so again, you know, nothing too surprising here, but really we have, you know, a byline right up at the top with a comment bug, you know, to show how much discussion it revolves around this particular article, uh, prominently displayed in the top right. And then the article title, you know, immediately beneath it. And then finally we have the summary or the deck that actually teases a little bit more about what's inside this article before the user commits to viewing it. Now in the old days, if somebody were to hand me this approved design, you know, the old days being seven months ago probably, um, you know, it would, it would probably be a fairly common assumption for me to basically just sort of st start at the top of this pattern and start marking it up more or less from top to bottom as the visual order has been shown. But as I've been working on more patterns like this, I've found that it's very helpful for me to ask myself just a really common question at kind of every stage of the design process, which is specifically, what if somebody doesn't browse the web like I do? You know, this is a, it, it's a fairly obvious question, right? But this is a really helpful way for me to sort of work my way out of some of my default assumptions. Um, it, you know, if I'm working on a widescreen layout, this question is a really great way of, you know, foregrounding the small screen layout. And, you know, it's just trying to balance both of those concerns side by side. But for a pattern like this, it's actually kind of helpful to think a little bit more about moving beyond the visual presentation of this information. If somebody's actually having this, in, uh, experiencing this in a non-sighted context, and they're having this information read aloud to them, starting right off in the markup, in the source order, with the attribution, could actually be a little disorienting. You know, who is this person that's being read aloud to me before I actually encounter the article title itself? So that's why it's really helpful when you're designing responsive patterns to step aside and put, look past the layout in front of you, and actually start from the content priority and build up from there. In other words, if I was going to look at this pattern, I mean, really the most important piece of information is the one that appears on the second row, which is the article title itself. And then immediately following that, we have the byline. And then I kind of decided that the summary, which appears at the very bottom, is actually the third most important piece of information. And then all the way at the bottom, in terms of priority, we have the comment bug, which from a visual standpoint is displayed most prominently up in the top right. But with this content priority in place, what I can then do is actually arrange my document to speak to that priority. And basically, you know, with some basic t styles in place, I can rearrange things in a sense that's gonna make much more uh, structural uh, sense from a, from a document standpoint. Moving from the article title all the way down to the comment bug, which appears inside of the summary. But this is just the foundation. I can then build on this to actually move up into that idealized view of the approved design. So basically, you know, I can use uh, one of the uh, wonderful layout systems that Jen mentioned earlier, like Flexbox, for example. I can surround the two most important pieces of information in some sort of containing element, called teaser head, for example. And then inside that containing element, I can mark up the article title and the byline as, you know, children of that container. Now, if I set that um, containing element to display as a Flexbox, and then I specify a flex direction of column reverse, it's like I've, I've changed the gravity within that container. And so there's two elements, even though the, the content structure says that the title should appear first and the byline underneath it, the visual presentation is gonna be flipped. And the article byline will move to the top and the title will then follow it visually. And, you know, I mean, Flexbox is amazing. I mean, I could spend hours working on this. If I had more elements inside that container, using the, uh, the order property allows me to be really prescriptive about how those elements are arranged vertically. It's a really wonderful layout module, and I love using it. But the thing is, is that at least in this particular pattern, <coughs> this doesn't do me any, any good for the pieces of content that reside outside the flexible box, like the comment bug that appears at the very, very bottom. <coughs> 
Ideally, what I would like to do is that if the browser supports Flexbox and introduces this more advanced layout, I want to take that common bug out of its dis uh, default position and move it up to the top and anchor it off to the right of the byline and the category information. Put it right in the top corner of this pattern. But I only want to do that if the browser properly supports Flexbox, which unfortunately is not as commonly supported as we might like it to be. So to figure out if a browser supports Flexbox, I kind of have to ask the browser if it supports Flexbox. And I can ask a simple little question in JavaScript that's basically just looking for um, you know, some specific Flexbox properties that I'm going to be implementing in this particular responsive design. And if the browser passes that test, it answers in the affirmative, yes, I support these properties, I can then append a class to the HTML element right at the top of the page to say that I've passed the test and I now have a class of supports flex. And with that class in place, what I can then do is I can sort of quarantine some more advanced styles for the browsers that are going to benefit from that more advanced layout. So I can conditionally turn that uh, teaser head element into a flexible box. But more importantly, I can apply some absolute positioning to the comment bug that resides all the way down at the bottom end of this pattern. In other words, what I've done is I've started from some baseline structural markup with some light typographic styles applied to it. But this really represents the true content priority that I'm trying to convey to the reader whether they can see the layout or not. And then if the browser passes the test, what I can then do is take the, uh, the comment bug out of its default position, and I can apply the, uh, the flexible box layout to the teaser head right at the top and change the order of the title and the byline. But I can also absolutely position the comment bug right up in the top right corner of the element to achieve the final idealized view of this one particular pattern. In other words, I think it's really, really helpful that when you're working on a responsive design, it's helpful to move past the visuals in front of you and design the content priority, the true structure that you're trying to communicate to the end reader, and set aside the layout as a final enhancement and move up to it from that foundation. And I, this works really well with simple content types like this article teaser that I've been boring you guys with for the last few minutes, but it can actually work really well for more uh, richly enhanced versions of different patterns as well. As a quick example of this, I thought I'd tell you a story about a circle that I designed recently. <laughs> Again, hold your applause. Um, I mean, more to, uh, more to the point is a story about four circles. Um, I've been designing a series of web applications recently, and I still don't understand what a web application is, although people tell me I've been working on a lot of them. Um, but they happen to be responsive, and they contain a number of really interesting patterns. And they tend to be highly transactional. And even in certain uh, UIs where you might be doing a whole bunch of rote tasks, you know, maybe 20 or 30 times at any given page, these patterns can be stitched together in interesting ways to build that larger UI. And you can still have fun interactions, even in something that's highly transactional. So like this four across picker that was designed, we kind of came up with a visual presentation and then started talking about some ways in which we could enhance it with some simple animations to sort of demonstrate that the, the UI had changed in certain ways when the user made a selection. And what we ended up settling on was a sim simple three-step process. That when the user makes a selection out of those four elements, whichever element they choose is going to move into the second position. It could be the first element or the fourth element. It's always going to slide to the second one. And then simultaneously, an OK and a Cancel button are go going to appear magically to allow them to submit or back out of the choice they just made. And then it's all going to have that super fancy transition animation stuff that the kids are talking about today. Now, the temptation, at least for me as a designer, when I'm looking at something like this and trying to think about how to prototype or implement this is to focus on the aesthetics, to focus on the, the shape of the circles or the typography. But really, the more devices that we're designing for, not just the different size screens, it's really important to put aside the aesthetics. And just as with the article teaser, what we want to do is ask ourselves the question is, how can we design a transaction first, independent of the interface? What is it we're ultimately asking the reader to do, independent of the aesthetics or the animation that we're talking about at the top level experience? For in a level of uh, four elements, and the user only ever chooses one, and then we present two other elements to allow them to submit or back out of that choice, what we're really talking about isn't a series of moving circles. What we're talking about as a foundation is a series of radio buttons. And each of them associated with a label that contains the text and the image that we're then presenting at the top level UI. And then we also have OK and Cancel buttons that are simple form elements, a Submit button and a Reset button to either submit the choice they made or to reset the form to its default state. Now, this is not going to win any awards. But this lightly styled form is the foundation for everything that's going to follow after that. 
Because what we can then do is that in certain enhanced browsers, we can start applying some more advanced rules. So we can, for example, sort of excessively hide the radio buttons from sighted contexts to basically move them off the visible edge of the canvas so that sighted users are only ever interacting with the label and the image that is left in the canvas. And then we can take those labels and turn them into table cells to basically make sure that they occupy 25% of the row that they sit in. And then finally, we can apply border radius to basically round off all the visible elements on the stage. Now there are some other light CSS rules kind of around this, but this is kind of the core mechanic from moving from simple looking radio buttons into something that looks a little bit more like this. Now, this is not anywhere where we want to end up, right? I mean, we've got some rounded elements and you know, things are looking bold and emphatic and that's very exciting, but um, we've got elements stacked on two rows and nothing is moving and animating in any kind of pleasing fashion. But again, just as with the radio buttons, this is the next step in the process for building this responsive pattern. This is the foundation for the next step that's gonna precede it. But to move past this step, what we then need to do is actually ask the browser another question. Just as before, when we were asking if, uh, for that one pattern, if they support Flexbox, this time we wanna actually see if the browser supports certain advanced animation features. And if it passes this test, if it answers yes in the affirmative, I am capable of more advanced animations, we're gonna apply a class of has animation to the HTML tag at the top of the document. With that in place, things get really interesting. Because we can move from a layout that looks a little bit more like this, and actually in those animation capable browsers, move into a single row layout. We're gonna take absolute positioning and use those, uh, take those uh, confirmation buttons and move them up over the, uh, the visible labels that the user is gonna be interacting with. And this stinks, we've broken the form, right? I mean, basically like we've concealed half of the elements that the user is gonna be interacting with. But what we can also do is we can actually use scale transforms to take those buttons and actually shrink them down to be zero pixels tall and wide. We can turn off their opacity and use Z-index to actually stink, uh, stack them underneath the four elements that the user is gonna be interacting with. Now that hiding mechanic we actually wanna reuse for any element the user hasn't selected in that four across picker. And that's where the second uh, sort of more complicated looking selector comes in. Now this looks a little hairy, but really all we're saying in plain English is that if our form has a class of selected, hide all the labels that don't have a class of checked. In other words, we don't have to write reams of JavaScript to track animations or position of individual elements within this pattern. All it has to do is that when the user makes a selection from these four radio buttons, it applies a class of checked to the label that the user just chose and then applies a class of selected to the form to signify that there's been some sort of state change inside the form itself. And when that happens, it's gonna use that same hiding mechanic to basically disappear all the other elements the user didn't choose. So we have more or less all the building blocks we need to finish off this pattern. We have a single row layout working, and then we have a simple show hide mechanic in place. And this is where we can finally finish things off with a little bit of animation work. We can apply some global transitions to all the visible elements in the page. And then we can basically use uh, nth child and translate tra x transforms to basically slide selected elements into the final position when they've actually made a choice. Now this looks a little bit hairy and I wrote it and I barely understand it. Um, but basically all we're saying is that we know that we have four elements in any given row. And we know that we want the second position to be the terminal one. Any element that we choose is gonna slide into that position. So all those translate X transforms that are using units of 100% are basically saying that each element when it's selected is gonna be moved relative to its width into that position, relative to a width of 100%. So in other words, all the JavaScript's gonna do is listen for when the user makes a selection and apply the selected class when, uh, to that radio button and basically change the state of the entire form, letting the CSS do the heavy lifting. And then when the user hits the cancel button and resets the state of the form, it's basically gonna move everything back into position. Simple class toggles in the JavaScript and letting the CSS do the heavy lifting within this responsive pattern. Now, maybe it's because it's late in the day or because it's my AM radio voice, but I see some crossed arms in the audience, right? I mean, maybe this feels like a little bit too much work. You know, that we've started with some foundational markup that, again, it's not gonna be winning any Webbies anytime soon. But then we've lightly enhanced things up into something that more or less aesthetically approaches where we're trying to end up. And then finally, we've implemented another layer in our pattern, which is completely animated and also completely responsive. And we're not really designing one interface, but three. 
And maybe that feels like three times too much work. But I'd actually argue for the state of the web and the state of the devices we're designing for, maybe this is the most economical way of thinking about designing responsive patterns today. You know, I think today, now more than ever, a well-crafted responsive design has to be considered device agnostic by default. And that's a fairly broad phrase, I completely admit that. But Trent Walton had this really beautiful essay about how he can treat this as a design principle for dealing with all the complexities in the marketplace today. And he basically argued that like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or on icy roads, websites should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. By thinking about your patterns, not just in terms of one final idealized layout, but in terms of layers, you're better prepared for a web that doesn't actually care about preserving the integrity of your design. And this notion of enhancement has been at the core of every responsive design at scale over the last few years. I mean, the BBC News is one of the most visible and often you know, highly cited versions of this, where basically they have a wonderful responsive site that houses all these UI niceties kind of peppered throughout it. But this is just one view of their responsive design. Because if you're on a slightly less capable device, or if certain network conditions fail the end user, you're presented with a UI that's completely responsive and very fast, but certain elements have changed their experience just a little bit. Those expandable menus are just skip links that bring you to the bottom of the page where the menus reside by default. Tabs don't to toggle content dynamically, they actually take you to a separate page where that content natively resides. And then secondary stories on section fronts don't actually have thumbnails associated with them. Those are seen as enhancements, not core content. Now the way that they think about designing every single pattern on their responsive design is by thinking about a baseline experience that's served universally to every web-connected device on the planet. And then they conditionally enhance up into something a little bit more refined, but it's still responsive, and it's still the same website. And so the process they use is going to be, seem very familiar to you now if you've been you know, sitting through this talk, um, which is this process that they like to call cutting the mustard, which is my new favorite phrase ever. Does your browser cut the mustard, sir? Basically what they're saying, they're committing to loading just enough code to see if your browser can then benefit from more code. They're inlighting just a little bit of JavaScript to see if your browser is sufficiently modern. And if it passes that test, then they bootstrap the UI with more CSS and more JavaScript to provide that more refined experience. But if it fails that test, or if the network fails the reader, they're still left with an incredibly fast and responsive UI. This kind of enhancement of designing sites or responsive patterns is one of the most effective ways of managing all the complexity in front of us from a device standpoint. Um, this basically allows the BBC and publishers like them to stop thinking about individual platform bugs and device combinations, but really focus on their site is existing in two broad experience tiers. And uh, both of them are incredibly fast and beautiful in their own way. There was this one wonderful quote that came up on Twitter a few days ago. Scott Gell basically said that we don't disable JavaScript just to test how a site works with JavaScript disabled. We do it to test how a site works in non-ideal net and browsing conditions. And I think there's something really powerful about that, that we can design for failure. But the other thing that I really wanted to hone in on is this idea of non-ideal. And I think with all the challenges in front of us and the state of the web and the networks that we travel on a daily basis, we should be looking for more opportunities to design for the non-ideal. Because as popular as it is to sort of think about the state of the mobile web, it's also, there's a lot of data out there to suggest that our view of the web and of the mobile web specifically isn't representative of the world as a whole. You know, Ericsson has basically gone on to say that roughly 60% of the uh, mobile data connections in the world today are sub 3G. That's 2G or lower in the bandwidth spectrum. And this is something that really speaks to the testament of the fragility of the network on a global scale. And we should start planning for and designing for this. And I loved this image that Sophie showed earlier, and this is really powerful because in the midst of the Syrian cri cr uh, refugee crisis, which is one of the greatest humanitarian crises of our time, one of the great through lines through all the photography that's coming out of these people looking for safe passage to safe harbor are smartphones. But these smartphones don't look like the ones that you and I might have in the room, and they're on networks that are nowhere near as powerful. And our definition of smartphone here in more developed economies is much, much too narrow. These devices are web capable with wonderful browsers on them, but they're much cheaper and much less powerful than the ones that you and I might use on a daily basis. There's this other quote that I saw recently that basically said that some of the next billion to come online are taking boats across the Mediterranean, the South China Sea, elsewhere. They will have smartphones. <laughs>
So I think it's interesting to sort of think about maybe we can change a little bit of the way that we think about designing responsively for the web today as we look to responsive designs next five or 10 or 15 years. That while we've been so focused on one particular view of mobile, maybe we can open it up a little bit more broadly. So that we're focused not just on devices, but on the people that are holding them, no matter where they may be. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. <laughs>